Good morning, everybody. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Today, this is the fourth Sunday of Easter, and it's Good Shepherd Sunday. Um, and worship uh, centers around the, the 23rd Psalm today, and you'll be um, speaking the 23rd Psalm together in, in worship. The um, the passage from the, the epistle from 1 John is, is, is good. And let me just share a couple of verses. We know by this that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God, God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth. And this is his commandment. We should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. Let us pray. Gracious God, whose son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads us, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. 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 One of the delights of my life is driving my two granddaughters, Madeline and Charlotte, to school in the morning. This was a big week. As you all know, Taylor Swift dropped a new album at 2 a.m. Friday morning. For sure, news. <laughs> This is serious. This is serious. Well, I know. Sorry. Sorry to be just. The, the much anticipated, the tortured, who knew that? Yeah. Poet. And it was a double album. So on Friday, I asked Madeline, what is her favorite cut from the album? And she told me the song, Florida. This is the first verse. You can beat the heat if you beat the charges too. They said I was a cheat, I guess it must be true. And my friends all smell like weed or little babies. And the city reeks of driving myself crazy. And the second, little did you know your home's really only a town you're just a guest in. So you work your life away just to pay for a timeshare down in Destin. Florida is one hell of a drug. Florida, can I use you up? Taylor Swift, this is what she said about the song. What happens when your life doesn't fit or your choices you've made catch up with you and you're surrounded by these harsh consequences and judgment? And circumstances did not lead you to where you want to be and you just want to escape from everything you've ever known. Is there a place where you could go? Well, with that, I want to introduce Emily, <laughs> who is a visiting professor of Christian formation and young adult ministry and the co-director of the Children and Youth Ministry and Advocacy Certificate and Specialization Program at Wesley Theological Seminary. Christian formation in the broadest sense, knowing, being, doing, is Emily's passion. Church and the minister changed her life. She wants young people to experience the same grace she discovered. And maybe Taylor Swift's words about her song, Florida, describe what Emily offers young people. Is there a place you could go? Emily is a graduate of Union Theological Seminary in New York and Duke Divinity School. 
She's the writer and editor of several books and has a new book coming out this year on the topic of adolescence, sin, and mistakes, which she's going to preview with us for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Emily, welcome to Westminster. been a big week at my house about Taylor Swift as well. <laughs> I have a, a almost 13 year old. So we are in our prime Swifty era. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, I am here to talk about everyone's favorite topic, which of course is sin. <laughs> we uh we have this book coming out and it's on the publisher schedule for next spring so it is with them and it's just kind of sitting there waiting for the publication and we are also waiting for a title so i can't tell you exactly what it will be called but i will tell you it is between two titles at this point one is nobody's perfect and one is perfect's not a thing. And I am gently pushing for perfect's not a thing rather than nobody's perfect because it makes it sound like there is some sort of ideal that we can all get to uh, if it's nobody's perfect. But if it's perfect's not a thing, then it's not a thing. We're not striving for it. We don't have to worry about you know some mark that we're supposed to reach. Um, it doesn't become... Um, something that we can fail at, which I think is important. Now, this is challenging, of course, when you're a United Methodist and we're supposed to talk about perfection and being made perfect in this life and all of that, but I'll just leave that up to God and I won't worry about it. So this book is about adolescence, sins, mistakes, and how we want to teach our young people about these things. And there are different ways that we can relate to both sin and mistakes. So I wanted to start by just asking you to kind of turn to your neighbor at your table and think about how you define sin and mistakes. How are they similar? How are they different? Okay, I was looking for the clock. So I can give you like two, three minutes just to think together about how you might define sin and mistakes. Sin and mistakes are an opportunity to learn. Seems to be a little more intentional. I guess there are sins. I was just thinking of a recently I was thinking of the thing that you know people might object to the fact that we're all sinners. And I was thinking the way to explain it to you, are you admit this? Being selfish is not a good thing. And then, will you admit to yourself that you've ever been selfish? So we're all sinners. <laughs> Under any definition, of, even not a religious one, I think we are, are all sinners. I'm very careful about this. Words. I know. Because it is, it is specific. It's there. It leaves out more than half a sin. Well, yeah, it depends on how you define it, but like I said, that my, my definition no, includes uh, everybody. No, many, many religions do not uh, use that as the definition. Yeah, I agree. So, it's not a question of how we define it. The problem is that we define it. And, uh, we leave out all the people who don't believe in God by defining God. Yeah. But it's, it's a difficult and that again is 
absolutely the line. All right, just about another minute. To bring everybody in. So we need a better term for what we're talking about. We need to demythologize the terms that we use in right. philosophical language that everybody should be excited. And just as a for instance, virtually every uh, religion has <laughs> the love your neighbor as yourself concept. Virtually every religion can, can be centered around the God of love. Is necessarily so, and, and the adherents don't necessarily see them. All right, let's hear what definitions you all have. It's always good to know what we're talking about <laughs> before we start talking about it, get a little common foundation. So, what are some definitions that you all came up with? For sin or for, Eat for both? Yeah. Well, we have a new title for your book. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I can pass it on. It hasn't been published yet. Perfection is the highest form of self-abuse. Perfectionism. 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 All right. So how, how does sin and mistake fit in there? Well, we all make mistakes for sure. And we have to learn to, you know, forgive ourselves. Yeah. And realize that we're just humans. Let's see. We wanted to make the distinction between intentionally doing something that hurts somebody versus just mistakenly. mistakenly. Okay, so so sin is about intentionally hurting someone, whereas a mistake is unintentionally hurting someone. Okay. What about yourself? Can you do hurt yourself intentionally and unintentionally? Does sin figure in there or mistakes? I think it could. Okay. I think that's what she's talking about when she say perfectionism is the highest form of self-abuse self, yeah. because uh, the thing I know about perfectionism is it's actually a defense mechanism. It's a good excuse for not doing certain things. Um, so it's it can it can end up really hurting you. Yeah, well, it can paralyze you, right? Yeah, you can't do anything if you're not going to be perfect at it. Mm -hmm. Right. And actually, when we're talking about adolescence, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm just high expectations that you feel like you have to meet. There was a study done by Duke University that said, especially young women, mm -hmm. felt like what they had to embody was effortless perfection. Oh. They had to be perfect in their social lives, perfect in their appearance, mm -hmm. perfect in their academics, perfect in their sports life, mm -hmm. without showing any work for it. It had to be <laughs> effortless or it didn't count. Oh. So you can see there how damaging that can be. Yes, yeah. All right, what about this table? Well, sin is a positive action as opposed to a mistake as a careless mind or something at times. But, um, but we actively sin, and we, sometimes we don't know we're sinning. So we use the word intentional also, but also in reflection sometimes, so if we're back, we can realize, yeah. That wasn't so good. Yeah, so we can intentionally sin, but we also might not actually know it until Accidentally later. Sin and realize we sin. Yeah, and then what was mistake for you all? Unintentional. Unintentional. Okay, so is an unintentional mistake also a sin? No. Okay, so there's a there's a there's a space to try to. You can see how hard this is to do, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, Willful is the word. Is it willful or is it some sort of thing? Okay, willful, willful, intentional. Mm -hmm. All right, what about this back table? We talked about that sin is something offensive to God mm -hmm. and that it can be intentional or unintentional. It can be, it could start <laughs> as a mistake that you just trip into. But, um, so it's about how God views it, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So a mistake would not offend God, whereas a sin would. In either case, it could be intentional or unintentional. Right. We talked particularly in the context of hurting other people. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't our conscience come into this? That uh, 
we are aware that we have sinned for our conscience. That's a hard thing for me to understand. One's conscience. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we might say instead that it's the it's the Holy Spirit, right? That the that at the ascension, when the Spirit is left with us, uh -huh. this it, it it can become our conscience. But that voice of conscience can also not be from God, mm -hmm. right? Because we get told, uh, we get conditioned, we get formed by all things that like not only God. Right. We get formed by our social locations, by our schools, by our relationships, some of which are not helpful to us. Mm -hmm. And they might become this voice in our head that we think is God and actually isn't. Yeah. And I'm having <laughs> toying with the concept. Do you have to hurt another person? I mean, obviously, you could say anything if you go far enough, it hurts somebody. But is is you have to be able to define that you are another person for it to be said. That's part of why I asked this table, what about yourself? Because you all said that you, you were oh, focusing okay. on other people and I wanted to ask, what about yourself? But we can also say, what about creation? That's not a person, right? But it's gods. <laughs> well, one of, one of the things I've been playing with is a lot of people do not understand. They think sin is a, a, a religious concept. But I was thinking if I was trying to explain it, which I wouldn't try, uh, <laughs> most people recognize selfishness as something inappropriate. Uh, I'm thinking of the concept we've all said. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us have been selfish. So in that way, everybody has sinned, even those who do not accept the concept of sin. I mean, I, it's just a word game that I sometimes play with. Myself. Well, our scriptures say that too, right? This yeah. is Romans, that all have sinned and all have fallen short. And there's something vastly comforting in that, right? It's not just me. No, it's not, Thank but goodness. a lot of people find that. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't say and all of them off right there. But as a practical yeah. matter, you can't be human and not sin. And you all said that about mistakes, right? Everyone has yeah. them. So everyone's making mistakes. Everyone's sinning. There's intention. There's unintention. Whether you believe in God or not, God exists. So the concept of sin is out here, even if you're not going to ascribe to it, right? And you're putting selfishness in that category. Yeah, something. And, and that's not a religious concept. But it fits right into, in my mind, of what we're talking about. It's something that everybody's involved, even if they're not religious. They're not trying to offend God. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I believe I've read that we are all sinners because we're born into a sinful world. Oh, yeah. And uh, it, isn't that the original sin that they talk about, of uh, being born into this world? <clears throat> yes, hold that thought. Hold that thought. But I find that Presbyterians in general are, are because of this total depravity idea that comes from Calvin, that Presbyterians are like, well, of course, people are terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> why would you expect anything else? We're all sinners. Right. Yeah. And it kind of lowers your expectations about other people and gives you the opportunity for, to forgive yourself and others. The idea that we're all sinners. Right. Um, I find Presbyterians tend to be more comfortable with that, actually, than do other traditions. Uh, yeah. And I will say that as a United Methodist, I have been in several churches where we skip over the confession. Uh, uh, so just an interesting little liturgical yeah. point there. Now, Methodists do believe that everyone is, is sinful, that everyone sins. This is not a non-Methodist idea. But I find that Presbyterians tend to be a little more comfortable with right. it. Okay. Well, Hang on, I'm going to... I'm sorry. Well, I wanted to go back to what Marty was saying about selfishness, that um, that was my original understanding of original sin was that babies, because I, could, I couldn't see, how, how could a newborn baby have done anything to hurt anybody, you know, and, but, but babies are very self-centric, mm -hmm. and so uh, it, that was explained to me that, well, because they're so self-centered, they are yeah. originally sinful. So that comes straight from Augustine. Okay. And I will be honest with you and tell you, I think that's wrong. Okay. Now, I am not Saint Emily. <laughs> I get that. I have was not a bishop in the 300s. I do not have the history and the sanctification and the whatnot. But I don't think babies are selfish. I think they're babies. Yeah. Right. But babies are self centered. It, but that, is well, there anything wrong with that? And so are adolescents. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> adolescents. And this is developmental. When we think about adolescents, and my my oldest child has started, she, they're, they're almost 13, right? But 
the the idea that everyone is looking at me is an adolescent developmental maybe i would call it a stumbling block they are self centered that doesn't make them sinful that's how that's how people develop we get self conscious in adolescence in a way that we never are as children and when i watch how children work in churches i see this often because we have our children's message and we have our children's choir and we have our vacation bible school and afterwards they you know show up and worship and they sing their song that they learned at vacation bible school but then they get awkward and they get stinky <laughs> And they start looking, you know, like the guys get the little shadow of a mustache. They don't know if they should shave. Their parents don't know if they should shave. Their, their limbs are six inches longer than they were yesterday. So they're like knocking things over. Like, so they start to get self-conscious because they're no longer a cute kid, but they're not an adult and they're awkward and they don't fit in their bodies yet. And they don't know who they are yet. Right. So then they're like, everybody is looking at me and this is awful. And it is so embarrassing to be me. Okay. Right. Well, it, I, I look at that transition. It's, you can get by with being cute when you're little. Yes. As an adult, you can get by with being accomplished. The teenagers or 12 years old are rarely cute or accomplished. No, and so it's, it's a really problem for them. You know? It's true. It's true. Yeah. And then you add in things like, uh, you know, neurodiversity. And it's even <laughs> harder yeah. because we say, well, we can excuse typically developing teenagers. But there are so many people who are not typical. <laughs> well, and thank God for that. All right, sin and mistakes. I won't call on you because you just got here and you weren't talking to anyone else. But did you all come up with some definitions? Well, I concluded that they were the same thing. Okay. All right. We talk about intentional and unintentional. We talked about a mistake being more like an accident. Um, Although some mistakes can have huge consequences, it's not necessarily a degree of consequence. Yeah. So let me just throw this out here. From what we are saying, it sounds like not every mistake is a sin and not every sin is a mistake. Correct. They are two separate things. They are also connected. And what we have found is that it's really hard for people to think about them separately, but we know somehow that they are different. We just don't know how they're different, which means we don't know how to teach it to teenagers who are afraid to make mistakes because everybody's looking at them. Everyone's judging them. And because they're afraid if they make a mistake, it'll ruin their whole lives. My, my youngest child who is six, um, had a chair fall on his head. He was, they, the, you know, they put the chairs up on top of the classroom table and then he'd like reached underneath to grab something. His backpack was on and knocked the chair over, hit him on the head. It was the teeniest, tiniest little thing, but heads bleed, right? Yeah. If you are a parent, you know this. Yeah. So the nurse calls me, he's crying hysterically. I go to pick him up from school and, and the nurse says, well, I have to tell you, um, I think he's really more freaked out than hurt. And he said that you always tell him that if he's goofing around, he's going to bust his head open. And so he, <laughs> figures, <laughs> so he figures that this just happened. And I was like, oh, good Lord. So <laughs> what parent doesn't say, stop goofing off. You're going to bust your head open. I will never say it again. <laughs> right. But <laughs> we make mistakes. I had no idea that this was going to be a problematic thing to say to my child. Um, and then he figured he'd made a mistake and now his head was busted open and like this was the worst thing that could possibly happen to him, right? So people make mistakes and people sin and there is grace for both. Mm -hmm. But the question is, how are we teaching this to our young people? Now, the reason that this is such a big deal as we have found is because what teenagers do in adolescence really can affect the rest of their lives. And the way that this book came about, we were at a meeting of the Religious Education Association. And we were uh, in our, we have working groups that are based around different things that interest the scholars and uh, practitioners at this meeting. And we were in the adolescent girls working group. So this is scholars and practitioners who care about the Christian formation of adolescent girls, especially. And we sat there and we were like, you know, 
it's really interesting how some people can make mistakes and some people can't when it comes to teenagers. Some people make a mistake in their adolescence. We were thinking specifically of Tamir Rice and they get shot. There is no room for a young black boy to make a mistake. Literally, it's a life and death situation. Then you look at a wealthy white male teenager who makes a terrible mistake and it gets almost, you know, erased from their life because you don't want to ruin the promising future of this person. So that we were thinking about the difference between Tamir Rice and Brock Turner at this point. And then we all came up with all these other instances where when you're a teenager, you're supposed to make mistakes, but some people die for them. And some people, it's as if it never happened. And we were wondering what it is that we can do as Christian educators to teach these young people about sin and mistake and the grace that is offered for both. And this launched this whole project. So when we begin the book, we, I'm saying we, because there are three of us who are editors of this volume. There's nine chapters. I think there's nine chapters. In it. Yeah. I'll tell you when I have the book come out, but I think it's nine. That's not on the top of my head now. So the three of us, uh, one is a faculty person in Toronto. One is a faculty person in Richmond, Virginia and me. And we co-wrote the introduction to this book and got the po folks from this uh, working group to write chapters and do research and figure out what we were gonna do about this. And so when we, what we start the book with in the introduction is to think about how sin has been defined. And you may know, you know, from, I don't know, confirmation class, how sin was defined for you. And it probably wasn't as nuanced as what we were just talking about here, because in some ways we need some simple definition to be able to work with. The problem is that we don't often thoughtfully complicate that. So a lot of people say things like sin is missing the mark. Have you heard this? Okay. So it's, you're shooting for a target and you just miss the mark. Or it is falling short of the expectations of God for our behavior. So that's another one. Or it is personal choice. So some folks will say, if it's not intentional, it's really not sin. So it, it's a personal choice that you make to do something that you know isn't what God wants you to be doing. But when we do that, we miss the opportunity to talk about mistakes. And for us, what we have found is that mistakes get to be the place where we talk about growth and learning. And if every mistake sounds like sin, adolescents are afraid to make mistakes. So we had interviewed some folks at a Catholic school and the teacher was like, I don't know what to do. These kids are like confessing about forgetting to text somebody back. That's not a sin, you know? Or they left their homework at home and didn't bring it in and they're calling it a sin. So what we found was teenagers really don't have space in their theological frame for the difference between sin and mistake. And we want to make clear that you will make mistakes. It doesn't make, it, it doesn't make you sinful and it isn't the same as sin. That mistakes are actually a place for growth and for development, which when we look at Christian formation is lifelong. When I told my kids that I was coming here to, to teach a Sunday school class, my middle kid said, well, I don't wanna go and be in a room with a bunch of kids who I don't know. And I was like, well, it's not a kid Sunday school class. <laughs> but what she's saying there is something that is prevalent in churches. Sunday school is for kids. Christian education is for kids. And somehow once you're done with confirmation, you don't really have to do any more of it, right? You go to youth group, but that's lock-ins and bowling or whatever. It's not really about faith formation. But that's not true. Faith formation, faith development, your, your growth in your spiritual life is lifelong. Dorothy Day said it was the biggest adventure in life was your faith development, your spiritual journey. So we don't want to truncate it. And part of that is making mistakes 
and growing and learning through it. We learn about ourselves. We learn about others. We learn about God. We learn about creation. We're going to make mistakes and we're in relationship with all of these things. Making a mistake is an opportunity for growth. The other thing that we found, yeah, do you have a question? Uh, not so much a question as an observation. Um, a mistake is a wrong without theological bag baggage. A sin is a wrong with theological baggage. And that is a vast difference between the two, which is meaningful to some people and not meaningful to others. And uh, to get in a discussion of the difference between mistake and sin without recognizing that sin is a theological term that's only meaningful to some people in a universe um, seems to me to miss the fact that the earth is not the only object in the universe and and that that uh, Christianity is not the only uh, belief system in the world that we live in for sure and we need to live in the world that we live in and we need to talk in language that is meaningful and not slanted when we talk to other people in the world that we live in. Your, your uh, 13 year old is concerned about sinning because people have imposed upon him a theological structure which requires a God and God mandated rules. And, and that's not essential. That is an add-on. It's not only not essential, it's not subscribed to by half the people of the world. Sure. But this is not an interfaith book. So this is a Christian education book. Well, I wasn't talking book. about your book. I was talking well, but we're, about... Well, we're the, talking the, about the educating Christian you young people. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about these categories of sin and mistake for this book which is what I'm teaching on. We're talking about the categories for Christian education of young people. You know, I would not suppose that Christian education of young people mandates Christian creeds and theology. I was a Christian young people. I still am a Christian young people. <laughs> I'm only 87. I've got a long way to go. But... Um, uh, to get engaged in any philosophical uh, discussion without recognizing the universe that you're living in, it seems to me, is a mistake. Well, so different people are going to have different lenses for their lives. We're talking about young people who are being shaped and formed in the church. And some we of are whom saying, are Christian and some of whom are not. We are saying that the lenses that they have been given to theologically interpret their lives has not actually been helpful around the topic of sin and mistake. So if, if that's not your thing, then fine. Sure. <laughs> but no, that's I what we're think, talking I don't about. Think all in this the young way. people today are Christian. Well, they are. They are? Sure. Not everyone, of course. Wow. But there are certainly uh, everyone that we talk to in our book is either teaching young people who are Christian or teaching, working with adults who are, so working with adults who are working with young people who are Christian in the church in various different Christian educational settings, including a Catholic school or a youth group. There's one uh, organization that helps kids do repairs on bicycles and that's their ministry. Uh, but they're all young people who are being taught how to develop their theological lens on their life so that they can see what it is to be a Christian theological person, which all of us are. Anyone who is talking about God is doing theology, but sin is a Christian category. And what we have found is that the way that it has been taught to young people by and large has not been helpful. And we want to help that. What we have found is that the way that kids have generally been taught about sin is that it is, um, there's kind of a, a standard held up. This is how you are not sinful. So this connects to that Duke University 
effortless perfection, right? Except that what we have found in the church is that the field of Christian education has assumed categories for young people that don't fit all young people. So like many other structures in the church, a white man has been upheld as the standard and anyone who is not that falls short. And that, that um, missing the mark definition of sin then fits there. So young women feel more sinful than do young men. And this we have found through our research. But what we want to do then is to not set up a paradigmatic adolescent, but rather to have attention to all of the different ways that young people are embodied in their life. And think about a theological lens that helps all of them. And this includes understanding the difference between sin and mistakes. So what we find, I'm kind of calling this section kids these days, <laughs> because when we're looking at who these kids are, right, we're going to make some, some assumptions. We're looking at right now they're Gen Alpha, generally, maybe the tail end of Gen Z and the upcoming Gen Alpha. Um, this is where we, we are. Our cuspers are in middle school right now on the cusp of Gen Z and Gen Alpha. What we find is that by and large, children and adolescents feel isolated from the caring adults around them. Some of this, when it comes to adolescents, is a misunderstanding that adults have that teenagers don't want them around. Do any of you uh, have connection with adolescents in your life right now or in the past? Did you raise an adolescent? You've got your grandkids. 13 year old grandson. Okay, do you ever feel like I'm a grown up and I'm, this kid does not want me around? <laughs> well, this kid feels like I'm threatening him because I've moved on the scene and I'm taking too much of his mother away from him, my daughter. <laughs> There's all kinds of complicated stuff when it comes to relationships with other people. But there is this like cultural idea that teenagers don't like adults. Mm -hmm. Have you heard this? Yeah. Well, they're embarrassed by them. They're embarrassed they're by them. They, yes. They want you there, but they don't want you to interact. Yeah, they're like, come here, stay away. Come here, stay away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we have this kind of like societal idea that teenagers don't want adults around them. Turns out that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't want their parents around them in case, in fact, they probably don't want their parents around them, but this is developmental. It is not actually personal and it isn't about all adults. Mm -hmm. It is developmental because what we are looking for through the developmental stage of adolescence is for kids to come out with a coherent sense of self. That's what we want. If we don't get that, then we're truncating their development. They can't feel like an independent person with a coherent sense of self if they don't distance themselves from their parents. So it's developmentally appropriate, but it doesn't mean that they don't want to be connected to caring adults. So when I look at the role of adults in a church, I see such amazing potential because if a kid doesn't want to be around their parents, they probably want to be around you. But instead, what we have is kids being sent to school, kids being sent to youth group. Youth group doesn't interact with the rest of the church. Kids are signed up for extra activities. Kids are trying to get into college when they're in sixth grade. <laughs> so they have to do a whole lot of things away from adults that are focused on their future instead of who they are in the present. They are also forced to engage the adult world without sufficient modeling about how to do this. They have jobs with grownups. They go to church with grownups. They are on social media with grownups. But if they're not connected to caring adults, they don't know how to interact in those different areas in their life where they're interacting with adults. And they are not going to hear it from their parents. That, again, is developmentally appropriate. Painful for parents. <laughs> This is why we need support groups for parents of teenagers. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And it's not just because there's like hormones flying out everywhere. It's because it's hard to have your kid break away from you. They will come back. Hopefully. Right? Leaving the nest. It is. Before they leave, it's leaving. 
It's becoming emotionally prepared to leave. Um, but we want them to have adults who are close to them and adults who are modeling what it is like to be in the adult world. At the same time, we also see that adolescents are living with a lot of the same challenges that adults are living with, but adults don't think that that's the case. Mm -hmm. When we look at things like how we practice the Christian life and we think about communal care, we think about hospitality, we think about solidarity, we think about responsibility for one another, these are all things that we need with our teenagers too, not just in the youth group off to the side. There's a wonderful book. Um, well, maybe he didn't write this in the book, but Mark DeVries, who writes wonderful books. <laughs> he said the best volunteer that you can find to work with your youth group is the person who knows all of the kids' names. They don't have a kid in the youth group, but they know their names. They are, and that has followed me in my own youth ministry. I have found the grown up who the kids want to hang out with for some unknown reason, right? They know their name. They want to check in. At one of my churches, it was the guy he worked with. This, um, he worked in the movie, in movie industry. And the kids were like, tell me about whatever movie you're working on right now. And then it became like the youth group would have movie nights with him. They were not organized by me. They were not at the church. It was not my thing. It was a caring adult who knew their names and wanted to share his love of movies with the kids. That was perfect, mm -hmm. right? But that doesn't happen a whole, whole lot. We also have, especially in the United States, especially in, um, well, in, in more Euro-American kind of communities, we have an emphasis on individualism and consumerism. Kids are modeled that really well, not only through social media, but also in the way that we interact with our world, we might be modeling that for them, consumerism and individualism. <clears throat> we think about Christian values of communal care and hospitality, but we see that our family likes to be really private. We have something big going on, but don't bring it up at church, right? So our teenagers and our adults are being formed in this culture and it's, often targeted for individualism and consumerism rather than communal care. And we need the church to counteract that. And often it doesn't. And sometimes it does in small ways and sometimes it does in big ways. But this I think is the challenge for us to be a caring Christian community. Any questions? As I'm trying to like set the scene for where these conversations are taking place. Question. I, not necessarily a question, but as you were talking about the the other adults in your life, it was interesting because I could start. I started naming all the adults in my life from from growing up in church, and some of whom I still keep in touch with. Um, and so that was something that I just thought was like normal. So I'm like, oh, that's not <clears throat> that people don't have those people. Uh oh. Um, so that was just kind of an interesting connection for me. And then I also took it over to the work lens with my young teammates who finished their education in COVID have come out, don't have the modeling, but then one of the things they often get here at work, because the big thing at work is, is agile. We do things in little like week long sprints and the motto is fail fast. So I'm also thinking that's gonna be a problem. Like as I'm hearing you talk, what happens to those folks as they come into an environment that's telling you to go ahead, fail fast, it's okay. And they're all discombobulated with sin and mistakes and they haven't had models. So it's it's just been, just telling you what's processing yeah. for me as I'm hearing you is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Scott, I saw your hand. Um, mm -hmm. Social media, talk, you know, that's all I hear about with my grandkids. Are they yeah. totally... Fixated. Yeah. Interestingly, we're looking at trends now and seeing that it's actually on a decline. So we'll see what comes next. Um, but the but the waters that our teenagers are swimming in now is social media, where their self-esteem is largely dependent on how people are interacting with their profiles online, how many likes they get when they put up a new picture, how fast those likes are happening, how many friends or followers they have. But they're also getting into this consumer culture 
you know, we were, I was on the subway in New York with my kid yesterday and there was an advertisement for some skincare thing. And my kid was like, oh, I've heard that's really good. And I was like, heard from who? <laughs> an influencer on TikTok? Cause you can't believe them. They are being paid to tell you this. And they were like, well, yeah. <laughs> right. But these influencers seem like friends. They feel close to them. When you're talking about feeling distanced from adults, if they feel closer to a TikTok influencer than to adults in their life, that's who's modeling for them. And they don't yet have the critical awareness to say, oh, it says sponsored at the bottom, <laughs> right? They're being grafted into this consumer culture, but they're not being given the critical lens to look at it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of their self-esteem is based on it. So that's what we have found. And it's, it's been really interesting to kind of watch the progression of that. You know, you can be interested when you're an academic, you can kind of step back and look rather than being terrified. Um, but adults who don't know what social media is, who aren't talking to their kids about who they're watching and how often they're watching, how much they're like all of this stuff, aren't gonna be able to help their teenagers to develop that critical eye either, which we really need to do. Yeah. I find it interesting to wonder what Jesus would think about the empowerment of sin, which comes from placing it at the center of self-understanding, when in fact his whole purpose was to free people from the power of sin and, and to focus on love as a center of self-understanding. <laughs> And when he is asked about belief structure, he thinks in terms of loving a God of love and loving your neighbor. Those are the things he's concerned about. He's not concerned about sin. Indeed, the whole idea of his dying on the cross perhaps unnecessarily, nevertheless, dying on the cross in order to free people from the power of sin was to get sin out of the central uh, posture in the faith that he knew, which was Judaism, not Christianity. And all of the developmental uh, jargon and creedal statements that have developed since then uh, may point you in a different direction from where he wanted you to be. He wanted you to be in a world where you were worried, if you were worried, about loving people. For sure, an and, active And love. not worried about sin. Mm -hmm. He the, the whole idea of that theology was to free you from the power of sin so that you wouldn't live under this cloud of sin. And it was very important that they get out from under that cloud of sin because it determined where they were going eternally. And, and so for them, that was important. But for us, what is important is to have a philosophical center that points you in the right direction. I'm going to push not, you on that. And that's, because, not my on. that's not by focusing on sin. So hang on. When First of all, this power of sin stuff is way more Paul than it is Jesus. Jesus talks about forgiveness a whole lot. Like Paul basically never does. Paul is talking about freedom, which when we have, what we have found in our work is that focusing on the power of sin, which we're going to distinguish from our sinning with a capital S instead of a lowercase s, we're talking about the power of sin. And what we find is that Paul's perspective on this actually can be hugely freeing for young people too. Because what Paul says, and I look at Romans 6 for the center of this, is that the power of sin has been defeated. When you are baptized, you die in Christ and Christ has killed sin on the cross. So kind of like the remnants of sin are still here, but we don't have to participate in it anymore. What we instead can participate in is Christ's living, which as you say, is about loving other people. 
But that whole business is creedal nonsense to someone who isn't a Christian. I agree. And we're talking most about Christian people young people. Are not. And I we know. need to live in a world with most people. But our focus. But my is focus on is on Christian education of Christian teenagers. Right. I didn't write a book for everyone else. And you can you can tell me that that was the wrong choice, but you know what? I am not writing Karl Barth here. I'm not, you know, we got one book at a time. I'm sorry, I'm not critiquing so, the book. Well, I hear you, but I'm here to teach you what I have found through my book. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So we have this theolo what we have found when we're talking about the power of sin, capital S, and how we participate in it, it actually gets to some of those structures that take agency away from young people. So I'm talking about like the patriarchal standards, and I'm talking about racism. Those things are the power of sin, capital mm -hmm. S, in systemic ways that hold us captive. And we can live free from that now. And so that's a, that's a part of the theological foundation of this book. So I'm fully with you on the power of sin and how we are free from that. And if you're interested in reading more about that and how I relate that to um, ministry with adolescent girls specifically, um, my book that came out in 2018 is about that. It is about Romans 6 through 8 and the power of sin and liberative Christian education for adolescent girls. It's called Arm in Arm with Adolescent Girls. So that book has a title. And it's out, you can buy it, you don't have to wait a whole year. <laughs> so here is our big theological commitment of the entire book. And what I'm gonna do is lay the groundwork as I'm doing here this week. And then when we come next week, I'm gonna walk you through some of the specific ways that we've seen this play out in the research that us and our authors did in this book. So here's the theological commitment of the book. Adolescents already embody the fullness of humanity and are fundamentally good. So we're arguing with Augustine there, although we don't say it. <laughs> so they embody the fullness of humanity and are fundamentally good. We have a lot of kind of cultural ideas that adolescents are like real people in waiting. <laughs> Like once you turn 18 and you can vote, you'll be a real person. Or maybe not even then, maybe it needs to be 21. Or maybe not even then, maybe 25. Y'all, I am in my forties and people are still calling me too young. So what are we waiting for, right? We are, you, we are full humans from the time of our birth to the time of our death. We have to stop saying that adolescents are not full, real embodied humans now. We take away their agency when we do that. And they're fundamentally good. And this goes to the imago dei rather than the concept of original sin. And the concept of original sin really is a, an Augustinian interpretation of part of Romans. So it's not, um, it's not everywhere. Not everyone ascribes to original sin. When we talk about sin, the power of sin, we're talking about a, I always get kind of like, what are people going to think when I say this? But I'll, I'll tell you who said it, and then you don't have to think that I'm weird. You can think he's weird. <laughs> so this is a, a New Testament scholar, Pauline scholar specifically, J. Lewis Martin. And he says that what sin is, is an anti-God power. That we've got three actors on this stage of humanity. We've got humans, we've got God, and we've got anti-God power. And that's what sin is. Sin and death work together to take away our humanity, to co-opt our agency, and to tell us that we are not free to make our lives in concert with what Christ's life is on earth now, which is, right, us being members of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So being able to act and live and love as part of the body of Christ now, we are free to do and sin tries to hold us captive. And sin is against us and against God, holding us captive. But when we look at the imago dei, it is not humanity that is bad. Humanity is good. We have the image of God in us. So this is a theological commitment of this book for us to be able to write the book that we are writing, to help adolescents to 
distinguish between sin and mistake, the ways that they participate in capital S sin, which is really important, and the ways that they are free to live differently, to be able to make mistakes, to be able to live and grow throughout their lives without it turning into self-hatred. All of this comes down to understanding that they are full humans and created in the image of God. The image of God is not something that you attain in adulthood. It's something that you are born with. One does not grow into the Imago Dei. Nobody images God partially. We image God, even adolescence. So three theological points, and then I'm going to pause for questions before you all go to worship. And then again, I'll bring back some of the concrete ways that we see this playing out through our research. One is that we insist on a positive theological anthropology. Adolescents are not their mistakes and they are not their sins. To say that they are is to continue to leave them captive to sin. You can't be free if you're under the power of sin. Adolescents are not their mistakes. This is a positive theological anthropology. Two, the image of God is not only an individual identity, but a corporate one. So you look at 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul says that we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So both of those are true. When we have the image of God, we do so as our individual selves, but also corporately together as the body of Christ which means that our institutions like the church and our communities matter a lot to this work. Churches need adolescents. We need their unique experiences, including their experiences of mistake making and including themselves as the victims of other people's mistakes in order for the image of God to be embodied corporately. <clears throat> We need the whole of humanity to come into our theological view, which means we need our adolescents. Not because the church is dying, which is often where we go with this. Oh, we need teenagers because they're the future of the church. They are the present of the church. If we don't have them, we are missing a limb of our body. We can't embody the image of God without all people here. And that includes teenagers. So we have to love them. We have to want them, even when they're pushing us away, right? Next, creation in the image of God undergirds a renewed appreciation in contemporary theology for the goodness of human embodiment. A lot of adolescents feel like their bodies are the reason that they sin. We argue that their bodies are wonderful, God created, and they are embodying the image of God by being in those bodies. And that is not a given way for adolescents to feel about their bodies or to be told they should feel about their bodies. For example, young women often are told that they have to dress themselves modestly or they will cause men and boys to sin. That tells them that their body is a problem that even if they're not sinning, they're gonna cause other people to sin. Boys don't get told that. <laughs> so that's a good example of how we're seeing these like patriarchal standards being held to all people. Girls cannot be boys, right? Even when we're talking about trans kids, they're, trans, they're boys if they're trans boys, but they can't, you know, and then there's the whole idea that, well, if you're a trans woman, you're not a real woman, you don't look like a real woman. Then there's this pressure to like live up to some standard of femininity as if femininity and masculinity are on a binary. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> the point is you are who you are and your body is good, whatever form it has, whatever size it is, whatever color it is, whatever ability or disability is part of it. We are the embodied image of God. So we need to have an appreciation for that, not think of our bodies as a liability, even if we can't sin or make mistakes without them. We also can't live as the body of Christ without them. Okay, 
Any questions? I was going to say that uh, that thing about uh, the women being the cause, that goes back to Adam and Eve. I mean, that's just been there throughout the whole Bible. And even when the when Jesus is confronted by the people who caught the woman in, in adultery, but he let the man go free. I said, you can't be caught in adultery all by yourself. It's true. Um, it takes two to tango. Yeah. And, uh, and yet the attitude has been there just all along yeah. that it's the woman's fault. Yeah. Yes. And Which is why feminist attitude. interpretations of the Bible, womanist interpretation of the Bible, mujerista in, interpretations of scripture are so important. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to fall into this trap because when it comes down to it, all of this is a subject of interpretation and there are different interpretations. And as we look at the history of interpretation, like most history, it's written by the winners, the people with power. So we want to mix that up and adolescents do not have power. So we want to work on their behalf in conversation and partnership with them toward their freedom and flourishing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's, I have a, a blessing for us to close with today. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.